Hello and welcome to Draft to Digital Spotlight. This is Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and I am honored to have with me in the virtual studio, Jane Friedman. Jane, welcome. Hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I wanted to start off just to give people an idea of your background in the publishing and writing industry. Well, I started off working in traditional publishing right out of college. So I have not had a break from the industry in more than 20 years. Whoa. Uh, <laughs> so I stayed at the same publisher. This was based in Cincinnati uh, for 12 years. I moved into university teaching for a while. Uh, and then I went back into literary publishing. And then I went full-time freelance in 2014. So that's a very short history of where I've been. Wow. And I want to talk about uh, one of your books, uh, the most one of the most recent books, I think it may be your most recent book on uh, the business of being a writer. And I, I found that it was important because your approach is, is uh, inclusive of traditional publishing and indie publishing. Uh, so when did that come out? And uh, tell us a little bit about what's uh, what this contains. So the book came out in 2018. It, it was the result of so many conferences and events, hearing writers say, I didn't realize I couldn't make a living off book sales alone. Um, or I thought that book advances or royalties, like once I got my first book deal, I'd be set. Now, yeah. granted, this this attitude is a little more prevalent, I think, in the literary MFA writing community, which the book is primarily for. Right. And a lot of people going into debt, for example, for MFA degrees and such. But, you know, in indie publishing, too, I think there's this, this expectation that, you know, you get your first book out or even your first two or three books out and, you know, the money or the sales will start rolling in and it just doesn't <laughs> happen that way. So the book takes a very long term career building approach and doing uh, organic platform building uh, activities. I talk about lead generation. So it's it's not looking at the book as the end all be all. It's looking at all of the different ways that you build a career over time. Would it be fair to say that there's that one to 5% of authors, the let's say the JK Rowling's, the James Patterson's of the world, um, that in the indie community, it, it's a parallel, right? There are a very small percentage that are killing it and making millions. <laughs> and then there's the rest of us, uh, mid, big, big giant mid list, right? Yes. So that in every field, you know, there's the, the top percentage of successful people that we're all kind of, we're all shooting for that. We want to emulate, you know, the people who are able to make a living doing presumably what they love or what, you know, they set out to accomplish. Um, but it takes time. I think more than ever, fortunately, like if I compare today to when I first entered publishing in the late 1990s, I think it's true that today it's more possible than ever to make a living just through writing, in my opinion, whether that's self-publishing or a mix of other things. Uh, I think today's market rewards people who are very prolific and productive, which is another burden as well, uh, blessing and burden. Um, but, you know, it's it's not just about write it and they will come. There are a lot of other elements, of course, that that go into the mix, which I'm, I'm sure we're going to touch on in the next half hour or so. Well, for sure. I mean, you you were part of the industry when that tipping point into ebooks happened, right? You were there yeah. before, during, and after. Yeah. Do you feel that we're at a, a different tipping point right now with... Um, potentially digital with what's going on in the world? Well, that right, this particular moment in time is a very unusual time. And I think we're seeing some of the weaknesses, particularly in, on the traditional publishing side more than anything. Um, I think we're seeing how the indie bookstore resurgence, as it's been popularly called, maybe isn't as strong as we thought. I mean, there's right. a lot of weaknesses in that system. Uh, traditional publishers have been really relying on print, uh, preserving print, uh, de-emphasizing digital, and of course, that's those chickens are now coming home to roost. So there's it's it's a strange time to, to watch some of the effects. I mean, it, it's such a long 
if you take the long perspective on this, it's, you know, when the ebook prices went up for traditional publishers and that I think it was around 2014, 2015, you know, just looking at how that is now unfolded to where we're at now, I do expect there to be some significant changes in the year or two ahead. But of course, it's very early. It's very early to say what's going to happen. But as far as like a, a tipping point for self-publishing authors and what's happening on digital on that side, I mean, I feel like it's, there's a little bit more of a settling effect. Right. Um, yeah. It's not the so-called gold rush era of, you know, the what 2012 is what they typically say was the gold rush if there yeah. ever was one. <laughs> um, so yeah, it does feel like we're we're entering the more mature phase. And obviously there are more challenges today with the way that Amazon is um, making it tougher to be visible unless you're advertising or doing other things. So one of the things that we've noticed at draft to digital uh, especially, I mean, the library market was growing already. It was on an upward momentum. Audiobooks, uh, digital audiobooks were growing in a significant way. And the last two weeks of March, library sales, I mean, they just went, well, in Canada, we would use the term hockey stick, but they, yeah. they did that that hockey stick curve where they yeah. just shot up. And that that hasn't even included the a promo that um, Over, uh, Overdrive is doing with draft to digital <laughs> titles to libraries for the cost per checkout model. I can't even wait to see what that's going to be. It almost felt to me that, um, I mean, you know, here in Waterloo, Ontario, and in Toronto, and major cities around uh, the world, North America, libraries are closed. You can't actually go and get the book. So, um, you know, I, I, I've always had a Kobo here in Canada, so I've had my library account connected to that. But I also downloaded the Libby app so I can now get access to um, right through the library uh, mm -hmm. audiobooks. Have you seen those sorts of trends um, from the other side of the industry as well? I haven't seen any specific figures yet on libraries since March. Uh, I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of information coming out soon. Right. But definitely within the last couple of years, you can see that there's a lot more attention and focus from publishers and authors alike on the potential and the growth of, of library, the library digital market. And you've got uh, subscription services like Hoopla. Um, and some others, especially in Europe, like Storytel, yeah. um, where it's a different model than the Audible model. It's more of like a Kindle Unlimited consumption sort of model. And so that offers a lot of opportunities for all sorts of publishers and authors. Uh, I think there's concern, though, um, and, you know, to some extent, rightly so, for, especially from traditional publishers, um, that those models aren't very favorable uh, for the economic model, especially traditional publishing models. So like, for instance, earlier this year, Penguin Random House pulled all of their titles out of Storytel, which is based in Sweden, does a lot of distribution to audiobook markets in Europe. And so, you know, Storytel pay pays based on a consumption model. It's not a, it's not fixed. Um, and so you can see they've, they also pulled out of script, if I'm not mistaken. So you can see that the publishers are just kind of, they see audiobooks now as one of the small kind of growth assurances they've had in a long time. And they're trying to protect that as much as they can. But so I, I just see very, it's always hard sometimes to talk about these changes because there are very different attitudes about these changes, depending on whether you're looking at it from like a big five New York perspective or the independent author. So right. I just uh, I just did an item in in my newsletter, the hot sheet, looking at some of the audiobook market potential, and you just see so many more uh, distribution and retail outlets opening up. You see more promotion and discount opportunities, like through BookBub's Chirp, and so uh, there's more interest now in going wide on the audiobook market than ever before, rather than being exclusive with Audible. And of course, now that Audible is just uh, or ACX rather has decided not to pay royalties on promo codes. I hope I'm not yeah. going too far into the weeds. You know, now there's <laughs> even more um, kind of reflection about, well, why why are we exclusive to Amazon? Would we be making more if we went wide? Okay, yeah, that that has been a, a hot button issue, especially just in the last couple of weeks when that was announced. Uh, I put up a hotsheetpub.com uh, as well. So let's talk a little bit about this. Uh, this is a, a weekly newsletter, a gathering of uh, talk about what the Hot Sheet Pub is and why it's valuable for writers. 
It comes out every two weeks, email only, and it's a newsletter I started in 2015 with journalist Porter Anderson. Uh, it's I'm flying solo now on the newsletter with occasional contributors. And so it's it does two things. It rounds up the most important publishing industry headlines for authors, regardless of how they publish. And then it also does deep dives every issue on, on specialized topics. Right now, uh, since coronavirus is really obviously affecting every single facet of the industry, uh, a lot of the issue is focused on looking at what, how is it affecting sales right now? How are publishers affected? How are, how's the supply chain affected? Um, but usually, you know, there's not, not so much of the issue is taken up with of the moment um, news. Right. It's more about long-term effects on authors' careers. Okay, so uh, and one of the one of the industry things that's uh, come out in the last uh, week is uh, Book Expo uh, America has decided not not to try to put it off to later in the year, uh, but to actually just um, think about two thousand uh, and uh, or twenty twenty one. London Book Fair was canceled pretty much at the last minute. Yes. Um, how how has that affected? Because I mean, I know when I was a bookseller. It would be May when I would be looking at what titles I was going to be buying for the fall. That's why I went to those types of fairs. Uh, how is that changing um, the operations then? I think for me, it still remains to be seen what might happen. And some of these fairs like uh, the Children's Book Fair in Bologna, they're trying to do more of a virtual style market event. Um, so I think we'll probably see some of those types of things happening as whether that's Reed or, or which does Book Expo in London Book Fair or some other organization trying to do something to fill in the gap. Okay. Uh, I did uh, Publishers Marketplace, which is the traditional publishing news source, and the, they aggregate deals that have been made in traditional publishing rights deals as well as um, new deals. And I did a, a count of deals in the month of March from uh, looking at 2019 versus 2020, and it was virtually the same. I mean, it was a little bit lower this year, but not meaningfully lower. Uh, but I'll be really curious to see what those numbers look like for April. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious to see what those are, too. <laughs> I'm also curious when I think about, um, so whether, whether an author is traditionally published or, uh, or self-published, that a book launch is um, well obviously a book launch in a traditional sense is is significantly more impacted i was talking to kevin j anderson the other day and he has a a paperback release coming out with tor and they've decided to push that off until the fall as opposed, i think it was supposed to be a june release um what 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 are the kinds of things that you've seen authors doing um with having to having to change it into a remote a remote sort of um activity. Yeah, this is this is tough. Um, it's tough for for several different reasons. One, adult fiction sales across the board were already looking soft. They've been soft for the past five years, at least on the traditional side. Who knows right. what might be happening on the self-publishing side that's contributing uh, to that softness. Maybe it's being those sales are migrating elsewhere. Right. Um, but generally, you know, when you have an event like this, it, it, it tends to depress fiction sales, although we're hearing a lot about how people are now, they have all this time at home, <laughs> uh, but they're not necessarily reading books. Um, they're playing games. Uh, there was a recent retail report from the New York Times showing that I think one of the biggest beneficiaries of what's happening are video game companies and streaming services. And eBooks, was they, they were there. They were at the very bottom, right. a small percentage increase. So... <laughs> I give all that context just to say that even if you pivot, which you have to do, even if you pivot with your marketing and promotion, it's a very difficult environment in which to pitch fiction, especially fiction by an author if the person doesn't already know who the author is. So right. during difficult times, we tend to go towards things that are familiar, that are comforting, that might provide us an escape. For instance, I'm rewatching The Outlander. <laughs> so it's like <laughs> you you go to these things that are just provide s some semblance of normalcy. I I think that's that's my psychoanalysis. So I would say that now is a really good time for authors to be looking at established fan bases, to be marketing and promoting to 
people who have already bought in. Um, if you do have a new release coming out, you I think you should still continue, frankly. I don't know what good it does to delay because who knows? Well, first, who knows what the fall will look like? And it's also election season. So it's like there's nowhere to run in terms of moving the publication date in my, in my mind. So I think, especially for independent authors, I think it makes more sense to continue with whatever plans you had, but you may be looking at a remarketing campaign somewhere along the way and looking at getting some of those sales back, perhaps when the book after this, this next one releases, you know. Yeah. Um, for traditionally published authors, we're seeing just an outpouring of virtual events and support from lots of different organizations, you know, everything from Lit Hub, which is kind of one of the major uh, literary news sites, uh, to poets and writers, you know, there's Quarantine Book Club. I mean, I, we could go on all day about these different events that are happening, but the big question is how much do they really move the needle for an author in terms of actual sales? So it's, again, it remains to be seen, but definitely the latest book scan figures, and this is just print, so we, we can't look at the digital market. It shows that new releases for adult novels are like way, way down. Um, and I think it's just something where publishers and authors alike are going to have to revisit those titles at a more advantageous time. Right, right. Now, I mean, it, it's it's um, at least a stat that I've heard kicked around over the years is that often uh, fiction sales do go down in an election year. And so not only do we have an election year, a pretty contentious, another pretty contentious election year, mm -hmm. but uh, we also have a pandemic, a, a global pandemic, which, you know, well, I mean, in our in our uh, experience in publishing, that has not happened because I, I wasn't around during the Spanish flu uh, era, but um, this is a significant change. I mean, I, the book industry, the Great Depression affected the book industry, right? Like that's where re returns came from, as I understand it. That's correct. Yeah. And we, we had to stick with returns until the current day. Everyone wonders, why do we still do that? And it's like, you yeah. just it's hard to go back. <laughs> it was a temporary measure to to support uh, bookstores who were who were yeah. struggling at the time, and uh, so publishers took all the risk. Then, yeah, and you've already I'm already seeing calls from people in the industry um, uh, for big publishers to have debt forgiveness for bookstores right. to ease up on the terms. I mean, there's going to have to be industry wide uh, support especially from big publishers, if they want to see the indie bookstore community continue past this. So almost like a cooperation and collaboration, which, yeah. which I mean, in my experience has been, authors have always been very collaborative. Um, sometimes contracts would restrict you from being too collaborative uh, with, uh, <laughs> but I know in the indie author community, often if uh, an author has been successful or find something that works, they're typically willing to share it. Um, the the thought of the rising tides uh, floats all boats. Mm -hmm. uh, if um, you know we're not in competition with one another, we're in competition with video games and Netflix yes. and stuff like that. So you see that that's probably a necessity in this in this pivot is that maybe there's more collaborations happening in the publishing between bookstores and publishers and and re like retailers, authors, etc. One hopes so, because uh, I don't see how you can get out of this like every man for himself. There, there has to be a lot of collective effort. Okay, what's uh, have you seen? Uh, I mean, I've seen some uh, some indications of people wanting to support small businesses, local businesses, and uh, I mean, I've made a concerted effort to. Uh, you know, try to order order my books from Wordsworth Books here in Waterloo, Ontario, as opposed to the easy thing to do, which would be go to, go to this big river place online um, and trying to think about those communities. Because, I mean, I, I maybe because I had to pay rent in a downtown location before. I know it's not cheap, especially when you have no more walk-in traffic. Are there other things that you've seen that people are doing that sort of uh, gives you maybe faith that, you know, we'll, we'll get through this, this publishing industry? Yeah, there, there are definitely bright spots. So there was a, just fortuitously, there was a new online retail site launched in January before all of this unfolded called Bookshop. Yes. It's it's from the same people who do LitHub. And yeah. their intention was to, as, as the founder put it, snatch a crumb from the giant's mouth. Uh, Amazon. <laughs> 
all they wanted was 1% of Amazon sales. And in their mind, that will sustain the independent bookstore community. Well, in a, in a very short order, they have achieved the level of sales they thought they would only get to in three to four years. Wow. So, and because of COVID-19. Exactly. So, uh, you know, their profits go directly, not all of the profits. I mean, they need to earn enough to sustain right. the operation of the site, but a good portion of the profits go directly to independent bookstores. So a lot of people have been making their purchases through that site. There's also an audiobook retailer, uh, Libro FM. So if you go to Libro.fm, you can buy audiobooks in a way that benefits your local bookstore. Uh, James Patterson uh, just made a donation of half a million to independent bookstores. Of course, he's been giving to inde independent bookstores for years. Yeah, um, yeah. And so he's just kind of adding more uh, onto that pile and trying to persuade others to do the same. He's partnered with Reese Witherspoon, who runs a very popular book club in order to get more donations to support the community. Uh, there's also the, the book industry um, charity group, it's called Bink, uh, that is doing grants to booksellers in need. So, you know, and of course some stores are just launching their own uh, fundraising campaigns. City Lights Bookstore in San Francisco, a beloved institution has already raised, I think close to half a million dollars uh, in order to sustain themselves through whatever's gonna happen next. So yeah, there there are bright spots, but not I don't everyone's not going to survive. Um, right. Certainly, anyone who was already weakened prior to all of this, they're they're in the most uh, unstable, uh, weak position. Obviously, now the the book industry itself, I've always uh, felt that um, maybe it was only 20 uh, percent to thirty percent ebook reading adoption in general, uh, which would which kind of explain why why the major publishers were heavily invested in uh, in the print business because that was the majority of their sales. Yeah. Um, I'm imagining now that that's probably going to shift to a little bit of a higher percentage. I don't think print's ever going to go away 100%. However, you have to put people together, <laughs> um, shipping to physical locations, et cetera. So that is yes. probably going to be a change we're going to see, I imagine. Yeah, I, I think there is going to be a change. And what Another bright spot for me, which, which I definitely, I was so happy to see this because I was, I hope it sends a message to traditional publishers. This might be hoping for the impossible, um, <laughs> but Open Road Media, which is the backlist ebook publisher uh, founded by my doppelganger in publishing, the other Jane Friedman, um, <laughs> not the same person. Uh, so Open Road Media was. Uh, they have thousands of titles, uh, mainly genre fiction that they market, and it's all direct to consumer marketing. It's all done online. It's very forward thinking, very innovative. They also have a marketing program called Ignition, where they help market other publishers' ebooks. And so, in any event, they just announced that their ebook sales are up 50%. Wow. And, you know, obviously we know why. And it's like, well, I wonder if traditional publishers are seeing something similar. Um, if they're not, they ought to be, but they might not you know, have the tools, they might not have the insights or the expertise of an open road media in order to pivot. Um, I think they, they've been catching up. Like, I don't think they're in the dark ages or anything, but their pricing has always been um, the problem. Like the, you, it's so hard to market and promote a 12 to $15 ebook uh, maybe if it's a James Patterson ebook, may maybe um, right. someone really wants that and they're going to pay or, or they might get it from the library uh, if they're willing to wait. Um, but imagine a new release novelist um, in this sort of environment where people are being asked to pay even $10 for the ebook. That just, what a horrible disadvantage for that author. I think that right. those are the people that I feel worst for. And I hope that there's some change um, coming out of this, uh, especially for them. So it almost sounds, uh, I, I know uh, from having looked at stats in the UK that a lot of UK publishers were already experimenting with lower priced eBooks and being a little bit more adept. I look at Hachette had purchased Bookature mm -hmm. and Bookature, you know, with people from traditional publishing uh, who had behaved like indie authors, uh, you know, adept, flexible publishing at, at low prices. Now, even though Hachette acquired them, they still behave 
-hmm. like a, a savvy indie. Yes. Um, yes. Are you seeing potentially that uh, American publishers are probably going to start uh, adopting similar <laughs> strategies? I mean, I do see them definitely doing the book bub sort of promotions and deals. Certainly publishers have cottoned on to discounting first in a series, uh, especially when a new book is about to release in that series. So they're they're engaging in some of those be best practices, but I don't always see a lot of flexibility generally on the pricing, especially given what the demand for that author might be. Right. Um, so what was it? Oh, I wanted to book, you brought up Book a Tour. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, just last week, they announced a new nonfiction imprint. And I just found that so fascinating. Nonfiction. Yeah, nonfiction. And I thought, wow, that, I don't know, it just feels like a bellwether to me of nonfiction is doing better than fiction right now, especially. It's been doing yeah. better for the last several years. And so I think that's just another indication of where people are getting their stories from. It's it's not necessarily novels or it's not only novels. Um, there's a lot of pressure on, on the people writing fiction. Okay. So... For from a writer's perspective, uh, and and I, and I'd like to coach this as a regardless of how the author is published, whether they they have a traditional publishing deal, whether they're uh, self publishing, or or whether uh, in in my mind uh, they're better off doing both. Um, what are some strategies that are probably um, going to be useful for for writers to consider in in the next let's say six to twelve months? I spoke to a range of marketing experts that I really trust and respect about how to change one's marketing position or outlook for, for this year, as long as this crisis might unfold. And there was a lot of focus on lo long-term investments, basically, and a back to basics mentality. So that would mean things like investing more time in your author website if you've been ignoring it, or... <laughs> If you've neglected your email newsletter, haven't been consistent, or just haven't given it the time of day, maybe now's a good time to, to get back to that. Uh, if whatever you've been doing on social, um, if it hasn't been consistent, take another look. Are there things that you can do that are that are creative and engaging for your existing fan base? I don't, you know, it's going to differ by author, but right. um, you know, think about. Netflix watch parties or trivia nights or other things that are just that are fun. You know, nobody really wants to hear um, a sob story about I need I need you to buy my book um, <laughs> right now. Every everyone is you know of course um, really concerned about what their livelihood's going to be looking like. But you have to you have to I think take a more long term approach and not panic. Um, right. So that's that's the message that I'm hearing. And it certainly mirrors what I've been doing. I've been using the extra time I have at home since I'm not going to conferences right? Um, to do all those things that I just haven't made time for. The, the Stephen Covey, it's the quadrant that it's very important, but not urgent. You know, all yes. the stuff that gets ignored because you're too busy keeping up um, with the urgent tasks. So right. that's what I would encourage authors to do and try not try not to race faster on the hamster wheel. Um, yeah. Use the time to reflect on what's long-term priorities. It's funny. Before before we went live, you and I were chatting and, and we both agreed that we had seen way too much of the insides of airports and hotel rooms. And and I guess we got we got our wish because we had several trips canceled. <laughs> um, I, I found it challenging uh, as, as a writer. Um, I, I find my time my attention span is is a little bit more limited than normal and, and i'm already very squirrely in my uh, approach to shiny objects as a writer yourself i know you're still doing um the non-fiction business of publishing and writing newsletter are you doing other other writing projects like book or other uh projects that um uh, during this time more or less, no. Um, the hot sheet newsletter takes up most of my writing time. And, okay. you know, my dirty secret is that I don't like writing books. <laughs> 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 they are so time intensive. They take so much focus. I, they're right. very draining for me. I would much rather be writing short pieces, looking at what's happening, um, 
like exactly what the hot sheet is doing essentially. Uh, I am doing more online education, more webinars of which you're going to be one of my webinar yes. guests coming up. <laughs> Honored to be week. part of that. Thank you. Um, and I find that really satisfying um, because it's giving, I feel like it's giving people an affordable way to stay up to date on, right. on some really important business topics. So like you're going to be talking about how to, you know, build better reader engagement and also make money off short fiction, which yeah. is something that I ordinarily dismiss short fiction. Like it's so I've, I've found it so hard to tell people, oh yeah, you can make money off those short stories. Uh, sure. Sure. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you do. And so, I, and I think that's something really valuable that people can focus on right now. Um, maybe writing or for the future, it's, it gives one hope, like there is a way to make this work. Well, I think I'm taking some advice from what you're saying. I'm always taking advice from what you're saying. But when you say that, you know, working on those shorter projects, working on those articles, as opposed to the the the, the giant project of a book, mm -hmm. you get the satisfaction of a complete piece of information or a complete story. Yes. And you get to see it. And then you get to see the reaction and the benefit. And then you can, it kind of feeds itself. So especially if writers are, are potentially struggling uh, maybe maybe that's uh, an alternative because it's definitely not necessarily as easy to sell something to an anthology that was dependent upon print book sales. But maybe, uh, well, an ebook I've always said does not have to be three hundred pages bound between two pieces of cloth. <laughs> right? It can be as short or as long as you want. Exactly. Um, so yeah. long 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 form journalism. When I worked for Kobo in the you know, 2014, 2015, two of the best selling indie uh, published titles were long form journalism, uh, 6,000 wow. word articles, because the newspaper magazine had to cut it down to a thousand to make way for ad space. Mm -hmm. um, but the writer retained a digital right. So they were able to, once the article went live, do a full version. So um, I think there may even be opportunities that uh, you just revealed <laughs> for nonfiction authors. Um, yeah. Now, I'll, I'll just mention quickly, there are two areas that I've seen both fiction writers and journalists take advantage of, uh, Patreon and Substack. Right. So both are, I would say, more email reliant. Uh, Substack is, in fact, an email newsletter delivery system, basically, that where you have free and paid tiers. And then I've seen such innovative use of Patreon by writers of all genres. And some take it very seriously and are able to earn serious money. Yeah. Uh, I know one literary novelist who earns, I think, upwards of 30000 a year based on donations. Wow. Um, and some do it as a way to just maybe, you know, give fans a treat or an exclusive or early access um, and make a little bit of money in it, you know, off of what they would ar already ordinarily be doing. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, we're going to start to take some of the questions. So I'm going to pop up one from Alexis here. And Alexis asks, um, how easy it is for authors to put books into the ever expanding indie market? What do you feel is the biggest difference between the authors that never gain visibility mm -hmm. and authors who find a way to carve a place for themselves? There's so many variables here, but I, I think that one thing that differentiates authors who eventually succeed is their understanding of of their genre or subgenre or their readership. So they just have a really finely honed sense of their place in the genre spectrum, the particular niche that they're serving, and what that reader is kind of looking for in terms of the the package when they're first looking at that Amazon page. A lot of authors fail on this and it's not necessarily their fault. It's just a lack of experience. So it's that combination of title, cover, marketing description, and some price plays into it as well. And so nailing that is really key. And I think even if you do nail it, some authors find that, well, this series, I feel like I got everything right but people, it just didn't take off. Like there's something about the premise that didn't resonate at this time and in this place. But for this other series, it did. And it consistently sells even when I'm not paying attention to it. So I don't want to chalk this up to like luck or you have no control or any of that. But I find that authors who are sticking with it and in the game longer and willing to be patient usually will, will find the thing that works for them. 
Um, I'll never never forget hearing Bella Andre speak about her success story, which mirrors a lot of success stories, in, in fact, where you know she reached book five or book six, and that's finally when things started to gel. Okay. Um, I think many people give up um, before they reach that point where it all comes together. And I know uh, historically in traditional publishing, a, a publisher would would sign an author knowing that they would not start making money until at least three or four <laughs> books yes. into the series. Yes, I mean that that seemed to change where where they had to make their money right away or they dropped them. Yeah. Um, but now it's that seems to be. I, I I still see so many parallels between <laughs> traditional publishing and, and indie publishing because that seems to be the case too, right? Like don't start marketing until you've got a few books in that series or a few books out, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think it also helps if you, if you're just very consistent with the branding and messaging outside of the series itself. So I already talked about the website and email newsletter and social, and sometimes people are just very scattered or piecemeal, or they haven't done any housekeeping they haven't kind of looked back and, and realized that maybe they have mixed messages or maybe they're just not, they're not, indicating to readers, hey, I have something that matches what you want. People can be really bad about describing themselves. <laughs> okay. You can feel like maybe you're being too earnest or it's too salesy or, you know, there's so many ways that we get, get conflicted about talking about ourselves. Um, <laughs> and my, I guess my cat has some opinions about that too. <laughs> <laughs> I got the cats out of the room. <laughs> I'm going to throw up this. This is kind of uh, related is M.A. Dalrymple says, uh, any advice on the tone book promotion should take during the pandemic that it might be different from the tone taken during normal times? I mean, how, how do you avoid seeming to be taking advantage of the fact that uh, people are homebound? Right. So you're not just jumping on the bandwagon to <laughs> sell them fearful things. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, some of this might depend on the sort of books that you're you're trying to offer. Um, certainly in some of the nonfiction categories, you may have something that is that could be really helpful to people right now. And right. so you, you frame it that way. Um, I think it also helps if something is available for uh, at, a, at a promotion or at some sort of discount. Um, given that people might not have the funds available that they used to. Right. Um, but I think you don't necessarily have to put, you don't have to apologize, you know, for, for mentioning that this book is out. I think you want to keep the same kind of author personality that you've always had and just include, um, I, I, you know, acknowledge what a strange time it is to be announcing this or whatever it is that you're saying. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, this is, this is your life's work and you're trying to make the best of it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, um, I just you know, popped this up as well. Um, of course, there are many, many fans of the hot sheet out there. So, uh, and that's hotsheetpub.com. Uh, let me see. There is a, um, is a guy or gee? Um, my, my apologies. I'm going to go with gee because I'm in Canada and I speak partially French. I'll soon be launching my first book in four formats. So ebook, paperback, hardcover, audiobook. Any advice in the order in launching them? Mm -hmm. So I know in traditional publishing, there's um, uh, the, the yeah. staging, yeah, uh, hardcover, and then a year later, the paperback comes out. What, what sort of advice would you offer in that case? For independent authors, I don't think the staging makes much sense. I think right. it's better to go out with as many formats as you're able to invest in. Okay. Um, audio, I would save for last or for later, depending on, um, I mean, there are a lot of variables here as far as are you doing it yourself? Are you going to have to pay a professional narrator probably? And so you may want to wait for that audiobook investment until another year or until you have a little bit more of a foundation underneath you. But if you have the money to invest now, great. I don't, I don't think it's harmful. You just have to wait longer for that payoff. Hardcover, I usually consider optional because if it's going to be done through print on demand, that means it's going to carry a fairly high price point. And right. it's it's pretty rare unless you have some really diehard fans. Uh, it's rare to get people to take you up on that, although you may want it just for your own um just for your own shelf or for friends and family, you might want to have that hardcover. And sure, that's not a problem. But I think in terms of the most important formats to launch with for your readers, paperback and ebook for sure at the same time. Okay, thank you very much. Can we talk a little bit about uh, audiobooks as sort of a follow-up uh, to that? Because I mean, 
the creation of audiobooks has never been easier before, right? We have uh, ACX and Findaway Voices as two of the, the places that a lot of people uh, know about for uh, audiobook distribution and creation. Um, but you did offer some sound advice because uh, I know I still haven't made my money back on the very first audiobook I did. Right. Um, I've made all my money back on all the short ones I've done, but not the full length ones. Um, it, is that uh, is that a trend that we're that we're seeing that it is growing, but it's not necessarily um, uh, as economical because the right. costs are higher, like almost right. like translations. It, exactly, it's very similar to what you see with translations. Um, I think audiobooks have, is a bit a bit of a easier investment to make because I think the market is growing, um, and you know often it depends on how you're selling it, but it can sometimes carry a higher price than what a translation might carry um so yeah i the the trend let's see i th for traditional publishers it's audiobooks generally represent about 10 percent of the overall picture so if you apply that i don't know that indie authors can necessarily apply the exact same percentage uh, and it does vary a lot by genre uh, but right. if you if you look at okay if I am making a hundred dollars off my ebooks every month that might equate to ten dollars for audiobooks every month if you right. want to take the ten percent as a rule of thumb so there are some genres where audiobooks are going to be a much higher percentage perhaps I see that more often in um, the categories where you might have more male readers um, I don't know why it is but podcasts and audio tend to have a higher male consumption rate. Um, so that might be a consideration if you're working in one of those categories. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thank you. Appreciate that. And, uh, let me see, uh, we're going to go with a more, uh, Ronnie is asking, what is your opinion regarding print book dimensions for genre fiction? So like, you know, six by nine, eight, five and a half by eight and a half, et cetera. Yeah. I, I like five and a half by eight and a half okay. or six by nine. Those are kind of a tried and true. Okay. And, and there's no real, I guess, no different for, for genre, I guess. Um, or I don't think so. I think, no. I mean, unless you were trying to do a mass market paperback, but I do not recommend doing that. So why, why wouldn't you recommend that? Um, mass markets. I mean, that to me that came up, uh, uh, that format evolved for very particular mass market retail situations, which okay. don't really apply anymore. People buy eBooks. Instead, that's why the mass market has just gone way down. It's 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 been um, plummeting for gosh more than ten years now, and it, it's not going to recover. It's just gone over to ebooks. So the actual mass market of today then uh, is ebooks are the mass market, right? Mass produced, mass sold, mass consumed. Okay, exactly. <laughs> uh, I have to pop up. I I did get so I got Guy right. Thanks, Guy, for uh, <laughs> acknowledging that. Um, and he says, thanks, Jane, for the answer. He's looked at the genre uh, memoir and the sales of hardcover and paperback are the same. Oh, okay. So, whoops, that's interesting. So are there, uh, we've only got a couple minutes left. I was wondering, was there questions uh, that you were hoping that we would uh, talk about or areas that you were saying, I really would love to talk about this one thing. I don't, I don't think so. No. Or, or did we, as Jamie said, every time uh, Jamie had a question, <laughs> we answered it. Uh, so there you go. So th Jane, thank you so much for covering such an amazing uh, spectrum of questions and topics and so that we were actually gauging what people were thinking and wanting to ask. So uh, I just want to remind people that uh, they can find out more about you at janefriedman.com or to uh, stay in touch with all of the changes that are going on in the publishing industry for both traditional publishing and indie publishing. The hotsheetpub.com comes out every two weeks? Every two weeks. Excellent. And uh, Jane, thank you for the work that you do, helping to educate, inform, and entertain us, and uh, wishing you all the best. Thank you, Mark.